Chapter 4 of Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It by William Walker Atkinson. Chapter 4. Memory Systems. The subject of memory development is not a new one by any means. For two thousand years, at least, there has been much thought devoted to the subject, many books written thereupon, and many methods or systems invented, the purpose of which has been the artificial training of the memory. Instead of endeavoring to develop the memory by scientific training and rational practice and exercise along natural lines, there seems to have always been an idea that one could improve on nature's methods, and that a plan might be devised by the use of some trick the memory might be taught to give up her hidden treasures. The law of association has been used in the majority of these systems, often to a ridiculous degree. Fanciful systems have been built up, all artificial in their character and nature, the use of which, to any great extent, is calculated to result in a decrease of the natural powers of remembrance and recollection, just as in the case of natural aids to the physical system there is always found a decrease in the natural powers. Nature prefers to do her own work, unaided. She may be trained, led, directed, and harnessed, but she insists upon doing the work herself, or dropping the task. The principle of association is an important one, and forms a part of natural memory training, and should be so used. But when pressed into service in many of the artificial systems, the result is the erection of a complex and unnatural mental mechanism, which is no more an improvement upon the natural methods than a wooden leg is an improvement upon the original limb. There are many points in some of these systems which may be employed to advantage in natural memory training by divorcing them from their fantastic rules and complex arrangement. We ask you to run over the list of the principal systems with us that you may discard the useless material by recognizing it as such and cull the valuable for your own use. The ancient Greeks were fond of memory systems. Simonides, the Greek poet who lived about 500 B.C., was one of the early authorities, and his work has influenced nearly all of the many memory systems that have sprung up since that time. There is a romantic story connected with the foundation of his system. It is related that the poet was present at a large banquet attended by some of the principal men of the place. He was called out by a message from home and left before the close of the meal. Shortly after he left, the ceiling of the banquet hall fell upon the guests, killing all present in the room and mutilating their bodies so terribly that their friends were unable to recognize them. Simonides, having a well-developed memory for places and position, was able to recall the exact order in which each guest had been seated and therefore was able to aid in the identification of the remains. This occurrence impressed him so forcibly that he devised a system of memory based upon the idea of position, which attained great popularity in Greece, and the leading writers of the day highly recommended it. The system of Simonides was based upon the idea of position. It was known as the topical system. His students were taught to picture in the mind a large building divided into sections, and then into rooms, halls, etc. The thing to be remembered was visualized as occupying some certain space or place in that building, the grouping being made according to association and resemblance. When one wished to recall the things to consciousness, all that was necessary was to visualize the mental building and then take an imaginary trip from room to room, calling off the various things as they had been placed. The Greeks thought very highly of this plan, and many variations of it were employed. Cicero said, 
by those who would improve the memory certain places must be fixed upon and of those things which they desire to keep in memory symbols must be conceived in the mind and ranged as it were in those places thus the order of places would preserve the order of things and the symbols of the things would denote the things themselves so that we should use the places as waxen tablets and the symbols as letters quintilian advises students to fix in their minds places of the greatest possible extent diversified by considerable variety such as a large house for example divided into many apartments whatever is remarkable in it is carefully impressed on the mind so that the thought may run over every part of it without hesitation or delay places we must have either fancied or selected and images or symbols which we may invent at pleasure these symbols are marks by which we may distinguish the particulars which we have to get by heart many modern systems have been erected upon the foundation of simonides and in some of which cases students have been charged high prices for the secret the following outline given by k gives the secret of many a high-priced system of this class select a number of rooms and divide the walls and floor of each in imagination into nine equal parts or squares three in a row on the front wall that opposite the entrance of the first room are the units on the right hand wall the tens on the left hand the twenties on the fourth wall the thirties and on the floor the forties numbers ten twenty thirty and forty each find a place on the roof above their respective walls while fifty occupies the center of the room one room will thus furnish fifty places and ten rooms as many as five hundred having fixed these clearly in the mind so as to be able readily and at once to tell exactly the position of each place or number it is then necessary to associate with each of them some familiar object or symbol so that the object being suggested its place may be instantly remembered or when the place be before the mind its object may immediately spring up when this has been done thoroughly the objects can be run over in any order from beginning to end or from end to beginning or the place of any particular one can at once be given all that is further necessary is to associate the ideas we wish to remember with the objects in the various places by which means they are easily remembered and can be gone over in any order in this way one may learn to repeat several hundred disconnected words or ideas in any order after hearing them only once we do not consider it necessary to argue in detail the fact that this system is artificial and cumbersome to a great degree while the idea of position may be employed to some advantage in grouping together in the memory several associated facts ideas or words still the idea of employing a process such as the above in the ordinary affairs of life is ridiculous and any system based upon it has a value only as a curiosity or a mental acrobatic feat akin to the above is the idea underlying many other systems and secret methods the idea of contiguity in which words are strung together by fanciful connecting links Feinagel describes this underlying idea or principle as follows the recollection of them is assisted by associating some idea of relation between the two and as we find by experience that whatever is ludicrous is calculated to make a strong impression on the mind the more ridiculous the association is the better the systems founded upon this idea may be employed to repeat a long string of disconnected words and similar things but have but little practical value notwithstanding the high prices charged for them 
they serve merely as curiosities or methods of performing tricks to amuse one's friends dr cothe a german teacher about the middle of the nineteenth century founded this last school of memory training his ideas serving as the foundation for many teachers of high-priced systems or secret methods since that time the above description of feinagel gives the key to the principle employed the working of the principle is accomplished by the employment of intermediates or correlatives as they are called for instance the word chimney and leaf would be connected as follows chimney smoke wood tree leaf then there are systems or methods based on the old principle of the figure alphabet in which one is taught to remember dates by associating them with letters or words for instance one of the teachers of this class of systems wished his pupils to remember the year 1480 by the word b i g r a t the capitals representing the figures in the date comment is unnecessary the student will find that nearly all the systems or secret methods that are being offered for sale in courses often at a very high price are merely variations improvements upon or combinations of the three forms of artificial methods named above new changes are constantly being worked on these old plans new tunes played on the same old instruments new chimes sounded from the same old bells and the result is ever the same in these cases disappointment and disgust there are a few natural systems on the market nearly all of which contain information and instructions that make them worth the price at which they are sold as for the others well judge for yourself after purchasing them if you so desire regarding these artificial and fanciful systems k says all such systems for the improvement of the memory belong to what we have considered the first or lowest form of it they are for the most part based on light or foolish associations which have little foundation in nature and are hence of little practical utility and they do not tend to improve or strengthen the memory as a whole bacon says that these systems are barren and useless adding for immediately to repeat a multitude of names or words once repeated before i esteem no more than rope dancing antic postures and feats of activity and indeed they are nearly the same things the one being the abuse of the bodily as the other of the mental powers and though they may cause admiration they cannot be highly esteemed and as another authority has said the systems of mnemonics as taught are no better than crutches useful to those who cannot walk but impediments and hindrances to those who have the use of their limbs and who only require to exercise them properly in order to have the full use of them in this work there shall be no attempt to teach any of these trick systems that the student may perform for the amusement of his friends instead there is only the desire to aid in developing the power to receive impressions to register them upon the memory and readily to reproduce them at will naturally and easily the lines of natural mental action will be followed throughout the idea of this work is not to teach how one may perform feats of memory but instead to instruct in the intelligent and practical use of the memory in the affairs of everyday life and work end of chapter four chapter five of memory how to develop train and use it this librivox recording is in the public domain memory how to develop train and use it by william walker atkinson chapter five the subconscious record file 
the old writers on the subject were wont to consider the memory as a separate faculty of the mind but this idea disappeared before the advancing tide of knowledge which resulted in the acceptance of the conception now known as the new psychology this new conception recognizes the existence of a vast out-of-consciousness region of the mind one phase of which is known as the subconscious mind or the subconscious field of mental activities in this field of mentation the activities of memory have their seat a careful consideration of the subject brings the certainty that the entire work of the memory is performed in this subconscious region of the mind only when the subconscious record is represented to the conscious field and recollection or remembrance results does the memorized idea or impression emerge from the subconscious region an understanding of this fact simplifies the entire subject of the memory and enables us to perfect plans and methods whereby the memory may be developed improved and trained by means of the direction of the subconscious activities by the use of the conscious faculties and the will hearing says memory is a faculty not only of our conscious states but also and much more so of our unconscious ones k says it is impossible to understand the true nature of memory or how to train it aright unless we have a clear conception of the fact that there is much in the mind of which we are unconscious the highest form of memory as of all mental powers is the unconscious when what we wish to recall comes to us spontaneously without any conscious thought or search for it frequently when we wish to recall something that has previously been in the mind we are unable to do so by any conscious effort of the will but we turn the attention to something else and after a time the desired information comes up spontaneously when we are not consciously thinking of it carpenter says there is the working of a mechanism beneath the consciousness which when once set going runs on of itself and which is more likely to evolve the desired result when the conscious activity of the mind is exerted in a direction altogether different this subconscious region of the mind is the great record file of everything we have ever experienced thought or known everything is recorded there the best authorities now generally agree that there is no such thing as an absolute forgetting of even the most minute impression notwithstanding the fact that we may be unable to recollect or remember it owing to its faintness or lack of associated indexing it is held that everything is to be found in that subconscious index file if we can only manage to find its place k says in like manner we believe that every impression or thought that has once before consciousness remains ever afterward impressed upon the mind it may never again come up before consciousness but it will doubtless remain in that vast ultra-conscious region of the mind unconsciously molding and fashioning our subsequent thoughts and actions it is only a small part of what exists in the mind that we are conscious of there is always much that is known to be in the mind that exists in it unconsciously and must be stored away somewhere we may be able to recall it into consciousness when we wish to do so but at other times the mind is unconscious of its existence further everyone's experience must tell him that there is much in his mind that he cannot always recall when he may wish to do so much that he can recover only after a labored search or that he may search for in vain at the time but which may occur to him afterwards when perhaps he is not thinking about it again much that we probably would never be able to recall or that would not recur to us under ordinary circumstances we may remember to have had in the mind when it is mentioned to us by others in such a case 
there must still have remained some trace or scintilla of it in the mind before we could recognize it as having been there before. Morell says, we have every reason to believe that mental power, when once called forth, follows the analogy of everything we see in the material universe in the fact of its perpetuity. Every single effort of mind is a creation which can never go back again into nonentity. It may slumber in the depths of forgetfulness, as light and heat slumber in the coal seams, but there it is, ready at the bidding of some appropriate stimulus to come again out of the darkness into the light of consciousness. Beatty says, That which has been long forgotten, nay, that which we have often in vain endeavored to recollect, will sometimes, without an effort of ours, occur to us on a sudden, and, if I may so speak, of its own accord. Hamilton says, the mind frequently contains whole systems of knowledge which, though in our normal state they may have faded into absolute oblivion, may in certain abnormal states, as madness, delirium, somnambulism, catalepsy, etc., flash out into luminous consciousness. For example, there are cases in which the extinct memory of whole languages were suddenly restored. Lecky says, it is now fully established that a multitude of events which are so completely forgotten that no effort of the will can retrieve them, and that the statement of them calls up no reminiscences, may nevertheless be, so to speak, embedded in the memory, and may be reproduced with intense vividness under certain physical conditions. In proof of the above, the authorities give many instances recorded in scientific annals. Coleridge relates the well-known case of the old woman who could neither read nor write, who, when in the delirium of fever, incessantly recited in very pompous tones long passages from the Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, with a distinct enunciation and precise rendition. Notes of her ravings were taken down by shorthand and caused much wonderment until it was afterwards found that in her youth she had been employed as a servant in the house of a clergyman who was in the habit of walking up and down in his study reading aloud from his favorite classical and religious writers in his books were found marked passages corresponding to the notes taken from the girl's ravings her subconscious memory had stored up the sounds of these passages heard in her early youth but of which she had no recollection in her normal state Beaufort, describing his sensations just before being rescued from drowning, says, Every incident of my former life seemed to glance across my recollection in a retrograde procession, not in mere outline, but in a picture filled with every minute and collateral feature, thus forming a panoramic view of my whole existence. K. truly observes, by adopting the opinion that every thought or impression that had once been consciously before the mind is ever afterwards retained, we obtain light on many obscure mental phenomena, and especially do we draw from it the conclusion of the perfectibility of the memory to an almost unlimited extent. We cannot doubt that, could we penetrate to the lowest depths of our mental nature, we should there find traces of every impression we have received, every thought we have entertained, and every act we have done through our past life, each one making its influence felt in the way of building up our present knowledge or in guiding our everyday actions. And if they persist in the mind, might it not be possible to recall most, if not all of them, into consciousness when we wish to do so, if our memories or powers of recollection were what they should be? As we have said, this great subconscious region of the mind, this memory region, may be thought of as a great record file, with an intricate system of indexes and office boys whose business it is to file away the records, to index them, and to find them when needed. 
the records record only what we have impressed upon them by the attention the degree of depth and clearness depending entirely upon the degree of attention which we bestowed upon the original impression we can never expect to have the office boys of the memory bring up anything that they have not been given to file away the indexing and cross-references are supplied by the association existing between the various impressions the more cross-references or associations that are connected with an idea thought or impression that is filed away in the memory the greater the chances of it being found readily when wanted these two features of attention and association and the parts they play in the phenomena of memory are mentioned in detail in other chapters of this book these little office boys of the memory are an industrious and willing lot of little chaps but like all boys they do their best work when kept in practice idleness and lack of exercise cause them to become slothful and careless and forgetful of the records under their charge a little fresh exercise and work soon take the cobwebs out of the brains and they spring eagerly to their tasks they become familiar with their work when exercised properly and soon become very expert they have a tendency to remember on their own part and when a certain record is called for often they grow accustomed to its place and can find it without referring to the indexes at all but their trouble comes from faint and almost illegible records caused by poor attention these they can scarcely decipher when they do succeed in finding them lack of proper indexing by associations causes them much worry and extra work and sometimes they are unable to find the records at all from this neglect often however after they have told you that they cannot find a thing and you have left the place in disgust they will continue their search and hours afterward will surprise you by handing you the desired idea or impression which they had found carelessly indexed or improperly filed away in these chapters you will be helped if you will carry in your mind these little office boys of the memory record file and the hard work they have to do for you much of which is made doubly burdensome by your own neglect and carelessness treat these little fellows right and they will work overtime for you willingly and joyfully but they need your assistance and encouragement and an occasional word of praise and commendation end of chapter five chapter six of memory how to develop train and use it this librivox recording is in the public domain memory how to develop train and use it by william walker atkinson chapter six attention as we have seen in the preceding chapters before one can expect to recall or remember a thing that thing must have been impressed upon the records of his subconsciousness distinctly and clearly and the main factor of the recording of impressions is that quality of the mind that we call attention all the leading authorities on the subject of memory recognize and teach the value of attention in the cultivation and development of the memory tupper says memory the daughter of attention is the teeming mother of wisdom lowell says attention is the stuff that memory is made of and memory is accumulated genius hall says in the power of fixing the attention lies the most precious of the intellectual habits locke says when the ideas that offer themselves are taken notice of and as it were registered in the memory it is attention stuart says the permanence of the impression which anything leaves on the memory is proportionate to the degree of attention which was originally given to it thompson says the experiences most permanently impressed upon consciousness 
are those upon which the greatest amount of attention has been fixed. Beatty says, The force wherewith anything strikes the mind is generally in proportion to the degree of attention bestowed upon it. The great art of memory is attention. Inattentive people have always bad memories. K says, It is generally held by philosophers that without some degree of attention no impression of any duration could be made on the mind or laid up in the memory. Hamilton says, It is a law of the mind that the intensity of the present consciousness determines the vivacity of the future memory. Memory and consciousness are thus in the direct ratio of each other. Vivid consciousness, long memory. Faint consciousness, short memory. No consciousness, no memory. An act of attention, that is an act of concentration, seems thus necessary to every exertion of consciousness, as a certain contraction of the pupil is requisite to every exertion of vision. Attention, then, is to consciousness what the contraction of the pupil is to sight, or to the eye of the mind what the microscope or telescope is to the bodily eye. It constitutes the better half of all intellectual power. We have quoted from the above authorities at considerable length for the purpose of impressing upon your mind the importance of this subject of attention. The subconscious regions of the mind are the great storehouses of the mental records of impressions from within and without. Its great system of filing, recording, and indexing these records constitute that which we call memory. But before any of this work is possible, impressions must first have been received. And, as you may see from the quotations just given, these impressions depend upon the power of attention given to the things making the impressions. If there has been given great attention, there will be clear and deep impressions. If there has been given but average attention, there will be but average impressions. If there has been given but faint attention, there will be but faint impressions. If there has been given no attention, there will be no records. One of the most common causes of poor attention is to be found in the lack of interest. We are apt to remember the things in which we have been most interested, because in that outpouring of interest there has been a high degree of attention manifested. A man may have a very poor memory for many things, but when it comes to the things in which his interest is involved, he often remembers the most minute details. What is called involuntary attention is that form of attention that follows upon interest, curiosity, or desire, no special effort of the will being required in it. What is called voluntary attention is that form of attention that is bestowed upon objects not necessarily interesting, curious, or attractive. This requires the application of the will, and is a mark of a developed character. Every person has more or less involuntary attention, while but few possess developed voluntary attention. The former is instinctive, the latter comes only by practice and training. But there is this important point to be remembered, that interest may be developed by voluntary attention bestowed and held upon an object. Things that are originally lacking in sufficient interest to attract the involuntary attention may develop a secondary interest if the voluntary attention be placed upon and held upon them. As Halleck says on this point, when it is said that attention will not take a firm hold on an uninteresting thing, we must not forget that anyone not shallow and fickle can soon discover something interesting in most objects. Here cultivated minds show their special superiority, for the attention which they are able to give generally ends in finding a pearl in the most uninteresting-looking oyster. When an object necessarily loses interest from one point of view, 
such minds discover in it new attributes the essence of genius is to present an old thing in new ways whether it be some force in nature or some aspect of humanity it is very difficult to teach another person how to cultivate the attention this because the whole thing consists so largely in the use of the will and by faithful practice and persistent application the first requisite is the determination to use the will you must argue it out with yourself until you become convinced that it is necessary and desirable for you to acquire the art of voluntary attention you must convince yourself beyond reasonable doubt this is the first step and one more difficult than it would seem at first sight the principal difficulty in it lies in the fact that to do the thing you must do some active earnest thinking and the majority of people are too lazy to indulge in such mental effort having mastered this first step you must induce a strong burning desire to acquire the art of voluntary attention you must learn to want it hard in this way you induce a condition of interest and attractiveness where it was previously lacking third and last you must hold your will firmly and persistently to the task and practice faithfully begin by turning your attention upon some uninteresting thing and studying its detail until you are able to describe them this will prove very tiresome at first but you must stick to it do not practice too long at a time at first take a rest and try it again later you will soon find that it comes easier and that a new interest is beginning to manifest itself in the task examine this book as practice learn how many pages there are in it how many chapters how many pages in each chapter the details of type printing and binding all the little things about it so that you could give another person a full account of the minor details of the book this may seem uninteresting and so it will be at first but a little practice will create a new interest in the petty details and you will be surprised at the number of little things that you will notice this plan practiced on many things in spare hours will develop the power of voluntary attention and perception in anyone no matter how deficient he may have been in these things if you can get someone else to join in the game task with you and then each endeavor to excel the other in finding details the task will be much easier and better work will be accomplished begin to take notice of things about you the places you visit the things in the rooms etc in this way you will start the habit of noticing things which is the first requisite for memory development Halleck gives the following excellent advice on this subject. To look at a thing intelligently is the most difficult of all arts. The first rule for the cultivation of accurate perception is do not try to perceive the whole of a complex object at once. Take the human face as an example. A man holding an important position to which he has been elected offended many people because he could not remember faces and hence failed to recognize individuals the second time he met them his trouble was in looking at the countenance as a whole when he changed his method of observation and noticed carefully the nose mouth eyes chin and color of hair he at once began to find recognition easier he was no longer in difficulty of mistaking A for B, since he remembered that the shape of B's nose was different, or the color of his hair at least three shades lighter. This example shows that another rule can be formulated. Pay careful attention to details. We are perhaps asked to give a minute description of the exterior of a somewhat noted suburban house that we have lately seen. 
we reply in general terms, giving the size and color of the house. Perhaps we also have an idea of part of the material used in the exterior construction. We are asked to be exact about the shape of the door, porch, roof, chimneys, and windows, whether the windows are plain or circular, whether they have cornices, or whether the trimmings around them are of the same material as the rest of the house. A friend, who will be unable to see the house, wishes to know definitely about the angles of the roof and the way the windows are arranged with reference to them. Unless we can answer these questions exactly, we merely tantalize our friends by telling them we have seen the house. To see an object merely as an undiscriminated mass of something in a certain place is to do no more than a donkey accomplishes as he trots along. There are three general rules that may be given in this matter of bestowing the voluntary attention in the direction of actually seeing things instead of merely looking at them. The first is, make yourself take an interest in the thing. The second, see it as if you were taking note of it in order to repeat its details to a friend. This will force you to take notice. The third, give to your subconscious a mental command to take note of what you are looking at. Say to it, here, you take note of this and remember it for me. This last consists of a peculiar knack that can be attained by a little practice. It will come to you suddenly after a few trials. Regarding this third rule whereby the subconscious is made to work for you, Charles Leland has the following to say, although he uses it to illustrate another point. As I understand it, it is a kind of impulse or projection of will into the coming work. I may here illustrate this with a curious fact in physics. If the reader wished to ring a doorbell so as to produce as much sound as possible, he would probably pull it as far back as he could and then let it go. But if he would, in letting it go, simply give it a tap with his forefinger, he would actually redouble the sound. Or, to shoot an arrow as far as possible, it is not enough to merely draw the bow to its utmost span or tension. If, just as it goes, you will give the bow a quick push, though the effort be trifling, the arrow will fly almost as far again as it would have done without it. Or if, as is well known in wielding a very sharp saber, we make the draw cut, that is, if to blow or chop, as with an axe, we also add a certain slight pull simultaneously, we can cut through a silk handkerchief or a sheep. Forethought, command to the subconsciousness, is the tap on the bell, the push on the bow, the draw on the saber. It is the deliberate but yet rapid action of the mind when before dismissing thought we bid the mind to consequently respond. It is more than merely thinking what we are to do. It is the bidding or ordering the self to fulfill a task before willing it. Remember first, last, and always that before you can remember or recollect you must first perceive and that perception is possible only through attention, and responds in degree to the latter. Therefore, it has truly been said that the great art of memory is attention. End of chapter 6 Please support me with a like and a subscription. Thank you. If you wish to buy this book as a gift to one of your loved ones, you will find the order link in the description.